Nick Canal Conorelli, uh, who is one of our village engineers. And uh, they'll be going through various topics tonight, but we thought it was important to share this information with you. Uh, we know that there are residents who want to know when their street is going to be attended to. Uh, and importantly, we want to talk about what the process is for how streets are selected, what the costs are, and as well as uh, what you can expect during a construction project. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris Button, and he will provide you a lot of great information tonight. Thanks so much, Administrator Rush. Um, we do have uh, two engineering staff members. Brandon Tonarelli is going to be giving you know, one of the presentations. We also have Bob Myers, who's our second civil engineer. So we have two in-house staff members. Uh, for most of our engineering services, we do use uh, consulting engineer firms, and they're the two individuals who, uh, who oversee that, uh, that work. Just to give kind of a little bit of a framework for what to expect tonight, the topic forums are set up to last about a, an hour or so. For probably about the first half an hour, uh, we're going to go through and share some information with you that we hope is educational. And then we want to open it up, and it's usually a great opportunity to ask some questions uh, about things you may be interested in. And then if there's certain things that you uh, want to talk about, maybe related to your property that you're not sure other people are necessarily want to hear about, we're going to stick around for a while so you can grab us one-on-one -on -one after, uh, after the meeting as well. Um, there are some note cards available. Uh, there was a sign-in sheet. Um, some handouts, uh, a bike path map, um, and some other uh, takeaways uh, with you, including some uh, leak detection tablets. So if you want to check and see if you've got any water leaking from your toilet, it's a good way to save money and uh, make sure you're not uh, losing any uh, water as a, as a precious resource. Given it's Earth Day, we thought it would be a good handout. Um, one item, just to note for everybody, tonight's session is being taped in order to be able to put that on the website so other people can, uh, can see that as well. So if you're going to Ask a question, if you can go ahead and just make sure you're speaking clearly and, uh, and provide your name. There's a newspaper reporter here uh, tonight uh, as well. So um, maybe if you can flip to the first page of the handout. There's a couple of just the highlights in there. Most of it's going to be uh, just a verbal presentation. But just to give you an overview of what we're going to cover tonight, um, we're going to go through a little bit about what the village owns and uh, needs to be maintained. Uh, we're going to talk about what some of those maintenance and rehabilitation treatments are. Uh, we're going to talk about funding, so how that work gets uh, paid for, um, how the village has been uh, creative and aggressive in trying to stretch our dollars, as well as how we've supported residents with some of those programs. And then we're going to be talking about uh, our current uh, program for 2015 uh, for road and some transportation projects, as well as the uh, program uh, going forward uh, for our uh, road servicing. So, to start off with, it's always good to, to start with the quiz just to make sure everybody is, uh, is paying attention. So, who can name the two seasons in Chicago? Winter, Winter and construction. Okay, I knew people from Chicago would definitely know the, the two seasons. That's absolutely right. And that's really why we uh, timed tonight's presentation to talk about as we're leaving uh, winter and getting into construction. Talk a little bit about what to expect uh, for this coming uh, season and why we do what we do and how we go about doing that. Um, the other question I think that comes up most often this time of year is we leave winter and you see some of the damage that's occurred uh, to roads with that freeze-thaw cycle in the Chicagoland area, is just when is my street going to be uh, going to be resurfaced? So there's other treatments that we use in the program besides just resurfacing. We're going to talk through those treatments tonight. Um, but just to provide some additional background on that question, you know, when is my street going to be done? In 2011, uh, which was a repeat of a study we had done previously, I think in 2004, uh, we brought in a, an engineering consulting firm to do a pavement analysis of all of our streets in the community. So we looked at what the condition of those streets were, we looked at different treatment methods, how do we most, and the end goal being, how do we most efficiently stack that program in order to uh, get the most amount of work completed for the lowest, uh, lowest dollar. So what we're going to be doing is coming up this coming uh, summer is we're going to be repeating that program to set the framework for the next five years. So once that work is completed this summer, then we're going to have a better idea of what the order and sequencing of that work is going to be. And certainly you can follow up with us later in the summer. We can talk to you about where your particular street may fall out, uh, fall out in, that, uh, in that program. Um, where I was going to start, since everybody likely uh, drove or, or walked or bike, maybe drove based on uh, us still somewhat being in winter weather, is to just talk about what the village owns. So in total, uh, we've got just under 200 lane miles of roadway in the, uh, in the community. There's about 140 miles of sidewalk, and there's about 13 miles of bike path that's owned by the village. 
Um, one of the common misconceptions we hear is that all roads in the community are owned and maintained by the, by the village. Um, and so in, in Woodridge's case and a lot of other uh, communities, other roads may be owned and maintained by other entities. So just to give you a couple of examples, on Route 53, uh, down running adjacent to seven bridges through the, through the community, that's actually owned and maintained by the Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, Woodward Ave, or I'm sorry, 75th Street uh, is owned and maintained by DuPage County. Um, there may be local roads in the community that are actually are owned and maintained by a homeowners association. Um, so even as you go through the, the village's corporate limits, there may be a pothole on the road, or it could be a snow plowing issue in the winter. Um, in that case, the entity who owns the road is going to be uh, going to be responsible. You can always contact Public Works if you see an issue, and we'll take care of relaying it to that other entity. Or you can always contact them directly as well. Now that same will hold true for things you may see in the right of way of those roads. So the traffic signal on 75th Street is also the responsibility of DuPage County. So when it's malfunctioning, if you contact us, we're going to relay that to the county um, in order for that uh, to be addressed. Same thing for sidewalks and bike paths that the Park District, Homeowners Association, the Forest Preserve, Townships, all those different entities may own uh, different pieces of infrastructure in the community. Just to give you one example, it's probably the most confusing one in the community is Woodward, uh, Woodward Avenue. North of 75th Street, it's owned by the village. South of 75th Street, it's DuPage County. Um, when you get uh, on the other side, so south of 83rd, it becomes county again. But then when you get south of Bowden, it becomes back to the, back to the village. So uh, it's something that really relates back to prior development agreements, improvement agreements, as far as who actually has jurisdiction and maintenance uh, responsibilities. But again, anytime you got a question, you can call us and we'll get it taken care of and, and pointed in the, the right direction. Um, first thing I wanted to talk here, if you want to flip to the, the next page in that handout, is just talk a little bit about our road program and, and the treatments and, and what we do on different streets. And it's more than just resurfacing, and, and that's why we, what the, the, the title for it is kind of reflects that. And it's, it's a pavement preservation program. So I want to talk through really the three primary goals of our pavement preservation program. Um, first one there is to provide an acceptable level of service by maintaining adequate smoothness and surface friction, basically the drivability of the, uh, of the road and the community. The second and third are really intertwined to preserve the structural life of the pavement and really to protect that investment that the village has in its, uh, in its roadway infrastructure. The goal and strategy of any pavement preservation program is that you want to attend to your roads while they're still in good condition. Um, as you put in uh, those maintenance dollars and programs, you keep them from deteriorating to a point where it requires more costly uh, rehabilitation activities. So as you flip to the next page, and I'll tell you, this is the most boring part, so don't fall asleep on me, I'll get you through uh, the rest of the presentation, but it really helps to highlight what I was just talking about, and that's the pavement maintenance curve. Um, and this is something that uh, national engineering groups have developed really focused on the Midwest area where you've got that, uh, that Chicago winter. So you can see on the bottom is in terms of years, um, and then the, uh, the vertical is the, the rating of the pavement. So over time, that pavement's going to deteriorate, and it's going to deteriorate very slowly. At some point, as it reaches a certain deterioration, that drop-off is going to be more significant. And when that drop-off happens, the cost to do that rehabilitation increases uh, significantly. You can see there are almost four times where you get to that point where you're looking at reconstruction as opposed to patching and, uh, and resurfacing. So again, the goal is you take the right treatment and apply it at the right time to the right section of road during its life, uh, life cycle. And again, just to kind of give a frame of reference, if you want to flip to the next page, looks like everybody's still with me, so it's good. We made it through the table deterioration phase is just to give you an order of magnitude when we're talking about these different types of, uh, of treatments. So um, just to kind of step through maybe an order of magnitude here is crack filling along the edges of a pavement, so really between the curb and gutter and the asphalt. Um, random crack sealing is just going to be crack sealing across that entire cross section of the roadway. Um, the next one is we're going to do some patching and sealing around it. Minor resurfacing is the most common tool uh, that we use in our toolbox, uh, is, which is about an inch and a half overlay of the entire driving course. Um, and then you can see this is where the costs really start to increase. Full depth resurfacing is where you go through and you take out all the asphalt to get down to that stone base and you nearly double in cost. And then full reconstruction is where you're actually removing the stone base and you're essentially building a, a new road in that same, uh, same cross section. 
These are all treatments that we use in our current program. And again, eventually all roads are going to need to be reconstructed. But the goal is to put those treatments in place here, deferring that from happening uh, for as long as possible. Um, and again, the greatest threat to, to staying away from that reconstruction stage is the winter and the freeze-thaw cycles. So that water infiltrating down into the asphalt, freeze-thaw happening, it starts to break apart the uh, uh, roadway, you have vehicles, traffic, heavy traffic, trucks driving on it, continues to break it down and it creates this nasty downward uh, cycle that uh, deteriorates the road. And again, that foundation, it's just like your, uh, the base. The base is just like the foundation of your house. It's what everything sits on. And so keeping that, um, it, the integrity of that there is what uh, supports the, uh, the entire road. So most of these uh, treatments are, are pretty uh, self-explanatory, don't have a lot of impact on a homeowner who's living on the street where they're occurring. But what I want to do is talk through a little bit about if you were coming onto your street to do a resurfacing program to give you an idea of what to, uh, what to expect with that work. Um, as mentioned, we're going to talk about funding in a little bit greater detail uh, later on, but generally what the village uses for the bulk of its road work is what's called motor fuel tax dollars, MFT. And those are funds that we get from uh, the state of Illinois that get distributed on a, on a per capita basis. Um, but because we're using those dollars, there are certain guidelines we have to follow that are dictated by the Illinois Department of Transportation or IDOT. So they have certain specifications we have to follow. There's processes we need to follow. They have specification manuals. They really lay out how the work is going to happen. So really is the first step. We've finished our engineering needs. Uh, engineering specifications and uh, bid construction details. We have to send those to IDOT, and so once they've blessed them, we go ahead and we go out for a sealed bid process. So that's something that's conducted by the village. We go out and we ask con paving contractors to submit a price to do this type of work based on the specifications that are there. They submit that in a sealed packet. We hold an opening. We take a look who the low bidder is, and we'll do. Uh, they have to meet IDOT pre-qualification standards. And so then we pick the lowest, most responsible, uh, responsible bidder. Um, so the first thing, once we've gotten through that stage, uh, the mayor and board will consider that and then approve the contract. Um, and then you'll get a letter from the village letting you know that we've selected a contractor, here's the scope of work, here's generally when it's going to happen. And it's got contact information uh, so you can follow up with us if you've got questions related, uh, related to the work. Um, one of the first steps you're going to see is our village staff or contractors are going to be out there. We're going to be adjusting structures or making repairs of structures like storm sewer catch basins, manhole lids, etc. And that's either defects that we found from those inspections related to the rover, or it's to readjust those structures to a height that's necessary for the resurfacing that's going to, uh, going to be happening. Uh, one of the next things you're going to see is uh, RCA or road construction ahead signage. So that's really for maybe people who don't necessarily live on the street, who've gotten that direct mail, but people who are driving through the area and want to know that construction is going to, uh, going to be occurring. Um, next thing, you're going to start to see markings on the uh, asphalt and curb and cutter. And that comes from our engineering staff or our consulting engineer noting that this is an area where a patch is going to occur. This is an area where uh, concrete is going to, to be replaced. And you're going to start to see the Julie locate flags. And that's something very important, aside from our work, even you as a homeowner, putting in a fence or planting a shrub, you always want to call Julie. And, and Julie, uh, again, it's a common misconception. It's not one entity, but what they do is they take your information and they send it out to everybody who has utilities, so Comet, NICOR, the village, so we can go out and locate them to make sure if you're doing an excavation, you're not going to damage uh, the uh, utilities that are underground. And for your own safety, if you've got an electrical service line in your house, it's underground, you're doing digging, you can get it in electrocute yourself. So you can go online to put in a Julie request if you're planting a tree or putting a fence or you can call 811 uh, to, uh, to Julie. So next step you're going to see is we're going to come through we're going to saw cut and remove the concrete that needs to, to come out. Um, and this stage is really the one that causes the greatest uh, temporary inconvenience to homeowners in the area. Because once we pull that concrete out and we go to report it, the concrete has to cure. It's typically about a week. Um, not a problem if it's adjacent to your driveway, but if it's in the sidewalk or in the driveway where you need to drive across, across that entire section, um, you're going to be temporarily out of your driveway. We let people know before it's happening so they can pull out a car. They don't need to call the police. We take care of the coordination so they can park on the street during that, uh, during that time period. Um, once that concrete's cured, you're able to get back in and out of your driveway, and that biggest inconvenience is, is out of the way. Next stage is we're going to come through and mill the asphalt. And again, depending on that resurfacing treatment, it may just be an inch and a half. It may be all the way down to removing all of the uh, all the asphalt. Um, maybe the, the best analogy is it's kind of like doing a, 
remodeling on your bathroom. You may suspect there's a problem behind a wall, but until you take that wall down, you don't necessarily know what's, what's going on. Same thing here. We do pavement corings into the asphalt to get an idea on what's happening underneath. If we've done utility digs, we review that information to see what we've seen when the ground's been excavated. But sometimes until you take that asphalt surface off, you don't necessarily know what's happening uh, underground. So what we'll do is once everything's removed, we'll then inspect the, uh, the mill surface. And we usually then start to do what are called Class D patches. So that's a deeper four inch patch into what's been milled to, again, restore that structural integrity of the uh, base uh, that's underneath before we come through and, uh, and uh, resurface the, uh, the area. Um, once those patches are complete, again, depending on how much asphalt is taken out, the contractor is going to come back through with their paving machine and put down either one or two lifts of asphalt or bring it uh, back up to the final uh, driving course. Um, we're going to come through, we're going to do landscape restoration, uh, going to do thermoplastic striping, so maybe it's stop bars, it could be other pavement markings uh, that are in the, uh, in the area. One of the things we do then, you're going to see us come back usually in the next year or so, um, depending on when that work was completed and giving that uh, asphalt a chance to cure as well. So we're going to come back on the street and we're going to crack fill along the curb line. So between that concrete curb line and the asphalt driving surface, we're going to come through and crack fill. And again, the goal there is to try to seal out uh, that water infiltration that can seep down into the uh, into the roadway and try to protect that uh, that base. One of the other items you might uh, notice if you're driving down a, a newly paved road is sometimes you're going to see a crack that goes right down the middle of the roadway. Doesn't necessarily mean that there's a defect related to the work that took place, but that's the coal seam. So they pave in one direction, the asphalt's hot. By the time they're coming back in the opposite direction, that first pass has cooled down. As they're coming back. It does seal up, but that's going to be the first place that you typically see a joint open up. When that happens, we go through and we crack fill that area as well. Um, just talking about kind of quality of work, um, the contractor underneath those MFT requirements is required to do their own QCQA, so uh, quality assurance, where they have their own testing company who is testing the concrete and asphalt at the plant as it's being placed to show that it's meeting those IDOT specifications. The village actually home, uh, hires its own materials testing firm, so they're working for us, not for the contractor, um, in order to do similar materials testing. So again, to make sure what's going down actually is meeting those, uh, those IDOT requirements that are, uh, that are in place. So then in future years, again, depending on how that road's deteriorating, we're going to come back for random crack fill, we're going to come back for patching, and eventually we're going to come back for resurfacing and, uh, and repeat that cycle. So there's a ton of information related to kind of how one of those programs is going to work. I, before I move on, is there any questions maybe related to your own roadway program that happened or that you saw happen, either in the village or maybe on another road that you had a question about maybe what the contractor consultant was, was doing up there? All right. Um, the next item uh, we're going to hit on here is uh, road improvement funding. And really, how does the work get Get paid for. There's a ton of different operations we just talked through. So, where does the money come from and how does that work? Um, one of the first things I want to do is again kind of give a frame of reference since everybody who drove in we came in on Center Drive right there. So, that was a road that we just resurfaced in 2014. So, we take Center Drive from Woodridge Drive, which was the limit of construction on the uh, west end, and you go to Jane's uh, Avenue, Jane's and 71st there. Um, I'm sorry, James, where, uh, which was the eastern limit of the construction. That was about just under 2,000 uh, lineal feet. Um, that project, and that, this was, again, everything I just talked through. So it was concrete repairs on the sidewalk, it was milling, it was resurfacing, uh, it was about $350,000. So a very short stretch of road, and that was the lowest competitive bid that came in, um, still a significant uh, investment. And again, that's not reconstruction, it's just a resurfacing of that uh, roadway. Now the good news on that road is actually we have received a surface transportation grant, which is a federal uh, road improvement grant, as well as funding from uh, Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. So those two grants actually paid for nearly the bulk of that, uh, that construction uh, project. But going through more of kind of the village's standard road program on local streets, um, we have two funding sources. Um, the first one is a local gas tax that when you shop at a gas station in Woodridge, uh, there's a gas tax that gets remitted back to, to the state and then to the village. And then through those motor fuel tax funds they talked about that are distributed on a per capita basis from uh, the state of Illinois. So all those revenues go into the village's MFT uh, fund. So it's a segregated fund 
The money that goes in there can only be used for certain activities that are permissible by the Illinois Department of uh, Transportation. <coughs> we do do additional projects, get supplemented by grant funds, and we've had a, a ton of success. It's been a big initiative of the mayor and board, and we've had a great, uh, great deal of grant funds come in. We're going to talk to those uh, in a little bit. Um, the gas tax is a great source of revenue because what it means is non-residents uh, non who come to town and use our gas stations are helping to contribute funding to our road uh, program. So encourage your uh, friends and colleagues and relatives to, to buy their gas at a station here uh, in Woodridge. Um, again, one of the common misconceptions we have though is that we bring in more revenue when the price of gas goes up. And actually it's, it's the opposite. It's a flat rate, so no matter how much you pay at the pump, we still get the same amount that's added on to the price you're paying. But as the price of gas goes up, typically people tend to buy less, uh, less gas. So it actually tends to reduce the revenue that we, uh, we bring in. And then, obviously, um, purchased a car, or leased a car anytime recently, fuel economy of cars has gotten much better, which again also decreases the amount of uh, gas that gets, uh, gets sold. Um, that other revenue source that I was talking about, the MFT dollars, just to talk through, and if you want to flip to the next page in your, your packet there, which is really makes up the bulk of the revenue that we receive. Um, I mentioned it comes in on a per capita basis. Part of the MFT funds are actually retained by the state for state and IDOT operations. Um, but just to give you, a, if you look at the bottom uh, block there of information where it says per capita funding, you can see back in fiscal year 05, per capita, we used to receive $29.15 per person. Um, in fiscal year 13, the projection ended up being correct. We got about $24.10 per person. According to the Illinois Municipal League, which is a, an advocacy group for uh, municipalities in Illinois, that's going to actually further decrease in 2015 to an estimated $23.80. So you can see that that revenue source is, is shrinking. And kind of the double whammy there is when you look at the village's population, we had some special census uh, growth, but when they did the decennial uh, census count in 2010, um, our count actually shrank for population. So again, the per capita went down and the number of people they're counting went down, which again has that double whammy of reducing our, uh, our revenue. Um, the other piece that kind of plays into this when we look at the top block is the village's street system. So between 03 and 11, we had a 12% increase in the area of pavement that we were uh, responsible for at about 1.62 million square yards. Um, as we get into the pavement analysis this year, uh, we have a record of those streets. And why, when I say lane miles, that, that's just measuring lineal feet. Roads can be different widths, so depending on the cross section, it could be more or less of square yards. So we'll be taking that data and updating it as a part of this, uh, this analysis as well. Um, the other issue that plays into it is obviously everybody's probably heard about some of the financial difficulties that are in the state of Illinois with, uh, with state government. And their financial issues, depending on how it gets handled, can actually have an impact on local municipalities uh, as well. So as those MFT funds shrink, um, it can actually reduce our revenue. Uh, the state actually took and used and swept part of those MFT funds into another uh, state account. And it's not, it wasn't a huge impact to the village. Per capita, it came out to uh, about $40,000. So it's not gonna cause a material impact. It's not gonna change our plans. but. If cumulatively, depending on changes they make in the future, it can certainly have a, a long-term uh, long negative impact. So that was kind of the, the downside. I want to take it to a little bit more positive here. But the village, you know, we saw these negative trends going back um, into the late 2000s of uh, what was happening with some of the revenue sources. So the village board um, wanted to, to take action and give staff some direction to, to make sure that we were evaluating and staying on top of this. Um, so we've been able to offset some of those revenue decreases with uh, the village's aggressive pursuit of outside grant, uh, grant funds. And you can flip through the next couple of pages. What we did is we took, these are all the infrastructure grants that we got between 2009 and 2015. For roadway resurfacing since 2009, it's about $5.6 million uh, in grant funds. Um, and when you look at, uh, this is an effort between Public Works and our Community Development Department, and you look at other infrastructures, it could be sanitary sewer, it could be storm sewer, it's actually over $7 million in grant funds. So really a significant amount of money that's come in from outside sources, which isn't money that has to be spent uh, locally here from the village's, uh, village's coffers. Um, we've made other adjustments um, actually to bring revenue into the road program and to free up funds in that MFT fund directly to road resurfacing. Um, 
So just to, to maybe give you an example, I mentioned IDAP as standards that we could spend that money on. Crack filling a roadway is something that you can spend MFT dollars on. Uh, the village actually shifted those crack filling dollars to the MF, uh, to the general fund. So it was something that is being spent out of the general fund to free up more dollars for road or surfacing, straight or surfacing activities. Um, the village has also taken additional dollars from the general fund and put it into the MFT fund to supplement that revenue, being able to increase and do more road work uh, each year. When you look at what's projected in the five-year plan, which again is going to be changed and tweaked as we go through and do this pavement analysis, we're going to be spending about $1.2 million a year for each of the, the next five years on road resurfacing. And that's just local dollars. There are some of these grant funds that are in your, your uh, packet here uh, that are going to be happening over the next few years. The value of those dollars is not included in the village's expenditures. It's just our local share that we have to budget for. So those grants that are 75 25 you take that 75% and you add it in, the value of what the village is doing is actually uh, actually much higher. And then on top of that 1.2 million, it doesn't include the value of those other expenses that are actually in the general fund now, which is crack filling, it's bike path maintenance, it's thermoplastic striping, it's some additional supplementary pavement patching, which comes out to about another $170,000 a year. So really, there's a significant investment that the village is making in its roadway system. Obviously, as conditions change, I mean, that's something the mayor, board, and staff are very cognizant of, and so we continue to evaluate that each year. How can we be more efficient with those dollars? Where do we spend those dollars to make sure that we are maintaining uh, the pavement uh, in the village to a desired level of, uh, level of service? Any questions on the funding piece before we move to the next one? I should have put more coffee in everybody before we started the, uh, the meeting here. Um, <coughs> Next item, I just want to talk a little bit uh, further about, uh, about funding. Um, most of those transportation grants that I had mentioned uh, that we've got are what are known as surface transportation programs, or STP grants. These are federal grants that come from the Federal Highway Administration and are funneled down and administered by IDOT. And they can only be used on certain roads. If you flip through, get past those charts with the grant funding, and it's the next, uh, next sheet there, which is uh, this one here in the middle that's got the red lines, those are what are called Federal Aid Urban or FAU routes in the community. Um, those are essentially they're classified that way uh, by the state, by the federal government, based on the volume of traffic they carry and kind of the connectivity that they provide to provide really your major traffic thoroughfares through the community. For Woodridge, really the best description is our major roads. You've got Woodward Avenue, um, you have 83rd Street, you have Woodridge Drive. You're going to see on here, there's some roads that you wouldn't think would be FAU routes. I think Westview is, uh, is located on there. Those are smaller streets that were FAU years ago before the community grew to where it's at right now, um, but they still continue to be classified, which is good in that it makes them still eligible to apply for, uh, for STP funding. Um, it's something important to note about the STP funds is it's a competitive process. So when we submit a project, we have the potential to be competing against all of the DuPage County communities as well as all the townships and the county. So there's a lot of competition out there when you want to get a grant, uh, grant project funded. Um, when you submit a project, you're required to submit certain background information. And then there's a formula uh, that uh, DuPage Mayors and Managers is the one who administers those funds uh, on behalf of IDOT for our region. And so they look at things like the cost of the project, the condition of the road, how much traffic is coming through, what's the accident history, come up with really a mathematical rating, and then using that to, uh, to rank the projects. So going back to things like Westview, it may be an FAU route, the likelihood of it ever actually receiving STP funding is very, very uh, low. Um, but again, if you want that competition from other communities, if you go through and flip through that chart, we've actually gotten 12 STP grants since 2009. So we've done very well um, related to those applications and the funds. We have gotten some other limited funds from other sources on non-FAU routes on your local roads. We've gotten some money from I mentioned Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. We've got community development block grant funds. Uh, we've received money from IDOT through their emergency road repair program. But generally, there's not a lot of grants you're going to find for local roads. Those are really a local issue um, that each community is going to handle a little bit differently as far as what's the desired level of service and how is it going to go about uh, going about being funded. Now, besides grants, uh, we've tried to stretch our dollars in other ways. Um, one of the things that uh, we've really had a big push for is working jointly with other communities for the betterment and uh, 
reduce reduction of the cost for services and programs for, uh, for our respective groups. So in DuPage County, we've got a number of joint bidding opportunities. So we've partnered with other communities to joint bid out concrete work, to join out that uh, to bid out other, uh, the craft work that I mentioned before. And so by having a larger scope in which really the specifications and process is going to be the same, if you're craft filling here, it's going to be the same as craft filling in West Chicago or any community, um, we're able to get a better unit price. Um, it also saves us staff. We don't have to go through that bidding process. One community does it. We're really sharing that responsibility um, with each community uh, participating and taking on a different type of, uh, type of project. And that, that partnership goes beyond just road work. We've done it for everything from our fuel and gas, which we work with DuPage County on. Our landscape maintenance, we just bid with Downers Grove. Our, I want to go back to a winter reference, it's forget not a winter, but we buy our rock salt underneath the program DuPage County offers. So it's a great way communities are working together to save all of our constituents uh, uh, money on the, on the services that are being offered. And, and kind of on that piece with the residents in town, and it's not, uh, uh, this first one is, is road related, but we do try to offer some programs to support residents for work they may want to do uh, on their home that's going to increase uh, value or adjacent to their home. On the road program, one of the things we do in that, uh, I mentioned the packet that goes out if we're doing a resurfacing project on your street, is we offer a private participation program. So we're going to go through, and if there's a sidewalk that structurally there's an issue, um, there's an offset, a trip hazard that needs to be addressed, the village, we take care of that. There's no cost regardless of where that's located. In some cases, there may be a sidewalk square that's cracked, or the person doesn't have a depressed curve, and they want to depress that curve. What we do is we take our bid prices and we send out in that notice to everybody. Let them know that you know we're going to be doing this project. Here's an opportunity. You can take advantage of these bid prices we've secured if you want to do some work um, in front of your own uh, in front of your own property. We send out a staff member from our office. We'll measure it up, provide a cost estimate. There's no obligation for that, and then residents are free to take advantage of it uh, or not. They would pay uh, the village, and we in turn would add that to the scope of work for our uh, um, resurfacing contract and oversee the implementation uh, of it. The other one, not road related, but again, another private participation that we've been offering for a number of years is on tree, uh, tree related work. But when we go out and do our parkway tree trimming program, we're going to be working in your neighborhood, and you have a tree on your own private property that you want to have trimmed. Um, with emerald ash borer uh, and tree takedowns of ash trees. Uh, we've uh, also have offered up uh, tree removals. Um, and that's something, that in that case, we secure a price for you. But since it's happening on your own property, you would, the resident contract directly with the contractor to take advantage of that opportunity. It's not an obligation, and you can get a price and decide you may have a different contractor you can get a better price with. But you know that it's a set price, um, and you also know that insurance and other liability requirements uh, are going to be address there's a certain standard they have to meet to work uh, work for the village. Um, next item I uh, was going to go through, I'm going to actually turn it over here to, to Brandon, and uh, if you flip to the last uh, page in your packet there, and that's really our 2015 uh, construction uh, projects, and Brandon's going to talk to you a little bit about this project, what to expect, timing on them, and give you an idea of the scope of what we uh, currently have on the for this year. All right, like Chris said, I'll be talking about the 2015 road work projects that we'll be having going on here. Uh, up here on the left, you see a, a map which you can look at after the presentation so you can actually see it. But uh, first I'll start off with the MFT resurfacing project for the year. And we have recently awarded the project to GA Paving. They're the little bidder on the project. And uh, we're expecting that project to start in late May. Uh, we're just waiting on uh, some HIDOT approvals, getting some contracts officially signed and approved through them. And uh, we're expecting the project to take approximately six weeks to complete. And uh, we're doing 16 streets this year. And uh, basically what the project involves is we're going to mill off the top of Chris said and resurface with asphalt and then also do miscellaneous curb, sidewalk, and driveway removal and replacement, basically where there's drainage issues or other major structural problems with, the, with those items. And then also included in the MFT project, besides doing work on those 16 streets, is we'll be doing some various patching throughout the village, and then also refreshing uh, the own plastic pavement markings where they've faded. We'll be refreshing those so they can be seen. 
Another maintenance project that we have going on this summer is the Crackville and a bike pad seal coating project. And that'll be taking place in various places all over town, which is shown on the map up here. And uh, that contract has also been awarded to Denler uh, through the joint bidding process. And uh, for a bike pad seal coating, we're just doing the village bike paths. And, uh, the specific ones we're doing this year at Woodward Avenue, from Bowden Road to International Parkway, and along 71st Street from about Pistaldo Park to Woodridge Drive. And we're expecting that to take place in mid-summer approximately. Uh, one of the SCP projects that we have being constructed this year is the Traffic Signal Modernization and Interconnect Project, which will be happening right out here. Uh, <coughs> Three intersections that are included in the project are Center and Plaza, Center and James, and James and 71st Street. Uh, in this project, uh, it has been bid already, and the low bidder was Hometown Electric. And uh, we're still waiting on IDOT to award the project officially. So once that happens, we're expecting the project to begin late May to mid June, potentially. And uh, that project will probably last a month, a month and a half in duration. And uh, during that project, the contractor will be removing and replacing the traffic signal poles, mass arms, and traffic signal equipment with uh, brand new ones. And then uh, also installing an interconnect between the three signals so that they can be timed to provide better traffic flow. Uh, the second SCP project that we have going on this year is the 71st Street resurfacing project. Uh, which the segments that are going to be resurfaced are 71st Street from Route 53 to Woodridge Drive, uh, James Avenue, which is from Center Drive to 71st Street, and then 71st Street again from James Avenue to Woodward Avenue, skipping over the bridge across 355. And uh, that bid opening for the project is actually this Friday, being done by IDOT as well. And, uh, once that is done and IDA uh, awards it, we're expecting it to begin in late July, which is, uh, they won't be able to start before then because we have stipulations due to the Jubilee and Fourth of July activities that they won't be happening until then. So again, with that project, it will be uh, similar to the MFT where they're milling and resurfacing the roadway. And uh, the contractor will also do miscellaneous curb and sidewalk replacement as well. And then another project close by is going to be the uh, Town Center parking lots resurfacing project. Uh, the parking lot is in need of rehabilitation, so we're going to be doing it in uh, multiple phases in order to reduce the amount of uh, parking spots that will be out of commission at any one point in time. So that is also going to be happening this Friday, the village is handling that. And we're expecting uh, the work to take place between uh, late June and be completed by early August. Uh, it's going to be done in that window in order to be after the Jubilee. But then uh, the library has a project going on in August. So we want it to be done by then because the library is also participating in getting the resurfacing done at their lot at the same time. So again, that the parking lot will be milled and uh, resurfaced throughout along with new striping and also some miscellaneous curb and sidewalk repairs. And then uh, 83rd Street Bridge Project is another one that will be starting up soon. Uh, work is expected to begin in May and last approximately a month. The contract was awarded to Alliance already. And uh, this project is one that the village is required to make improvements to the pedestrian travel area. North, on the north side of the bridge, uh, crossing 355 on 83rd Street. So, and they're also going to be doing a few uh, minor repairs to the bridge deck. And uh, they'll just have some lane shifting, no closures during this project. So those are the main projects for this coming year, but we also have a few more that are in development for the 2016 and 17 years coming up. Uh, for 83rd Street, we have a SCP grant that we awarded jointly with Darian. And uh, 
the limits of that project are going to be from James to Lamont Road, skipping over the I-355 bridge there. So that today actually was the deadline for receiving proposals from engineering firms for doing the design and construction engineering on it. And it has a expected construction summer 2016. And then we also received proposals today as well for the Woodridge Drive project from 75th Street to Center. And that one's going to be expected to be completed in summer 2017 construction. We also were awarded a CDBG grant for Scenic Wooden Elm. And that one will be designed and inspected in-house by village staff. And we're expecting that to be constructed in 2016, unless there's some grant issues which require us to do it this year. And then there's also, we've also obtained grants for International Parkway and from the Dine to Woodward and for Woodward Avenue from the 55 Bridge to International Parkway, which will be even past 2017 when those would actually be constructed. So that's it for update on what's going to be happening in the coming years. I'll turn it back over to Chris. Okay, and so just to kind of take it full circle, uh, I mentioned start off the presentation, we're going to be updating that 2011 uh, uh, system wide pavement analysis. That uh, RFP, the request for proposal solicitation, Brandon mentioned actually three projects uh, the two engineering ones he had mentioned for design. And then we also requested qualifications from firms uh, to update that pavement analysis for us. So we're going to be going through evaluating those, conducting interviews, and then bringing a recommendation back to the mayor and board on the uh, uh, firms that we would recommend to, to undertake that, uh, that work. So again, we're going to look at the condition of all of those you know, just under 200 lane miles of uh, roadway in the community, and look at our maintenance and rehabilitation scenarios and treatment cycles. And again, the goal of doing this is to lay out that framework for the five year plan and make sure we're spending those dollars in the most efficient way, uh, efficient way possible. So that really winds up, our goal was 40 minutes to have about 20 minutes of questions, so we came uh, relatively close there. Um, so we wanted to open it up if there are any questions you have about what we've gone through or maybe something we missed that we should have talked about, we're glad to, to answer those. Um, if you got something you want to stick around, if there aren't any group questions, you know, Brandon, myself, and Bob, or other uh, civil engineer will be here and we can answer those for you as well. Don't go away, kids. It takes me a minute. <laughs> Chris, um, we live in a cul-de-sac, and um, my question pertains to the issue of not only the surface of that road, but, and you know, um, the drainage issues coming from um, Bradley and Clark coming down that way. Um, who looks at those and who makes decisions what needs to be done and if the residents need to have input, who do we input to? And, and by the way, um, I have to say that I've lived in Woodridge for 24 years and you folks have never not been responsive to something that we've said and we are very grateful for that. So I just thought I'd throw that in. Appreciate that, and it's that's not just necessarily me. That I mean, the staff work in the department. We've got a great group of staff in the public works department. It's certainly our uh, our goal that we we strive for. So usually, when there's drainage issues, those can be addressed sometimes outside of actually a, a road improvement program. That's probably something important to mention. Is even if a road isn't necessarily scheduled, sometimes especially over winter, you may have some deterioration that happens. And so when that occurs, some of that patching that Brandon had mentioned, miscellaneous patching around the community, we would go out and, and add that to the cycle. Or even outside of the NFT contract, we would go out there in order to do work. Same for drainage. Sometimes there's an issue that comes up where we need to change structures, or there's a sinkhole that developed next to it, we need to go in there and uh, make some repairs. Um, sometimes it would be a longer term fix, and that would be actually have to plan for more of a capital improvement for a storm sewer uh, extension. Um, what we do is we partner with, sometimes drainage issues can be caused by the private property drainage, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, sometimes it's caused by just simply the topography of the layout. So our staff and community development would work together to, to look at those. So we can touch base, and I know we've, we've talked in the past about some of those. We can talk about some improvements we have planned for the area out near you, and maybe talk about how some of those issues can get, uh, get worked into the program.
Other questions? Good answer. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Oh, um, I did, I'm sorry. Um, our question mainly was 71st Street, and it mentions resurfacing. But I noticed in the beginning of that section, there's two different resurfacing. Um, there's minor resurfacing and full depth resurfacing. Right. How do we know which one, or is there one assigned yet to 71st Street? Well, and there's actually a third one. It's not even less. But there's the minor resurfacing, which is an inch and a half. Full depth is we're taking out all the asphalt. Um, 71st Street is an STP project with uh, IDOT. And so that's actually what's called a LAFO, which is a local agency functional overlay, which is a deeper uh, mill. Uh, we're in, I think it's two and a half. I think it varies on 71st Street. I think mean, two and a half in some locations. I want to say like up to three and three and a half numbers. Yeah. Um, we did include on 71st Street, and I think you're referring to the area closer to 53, correct? Yeah. We actually included uh, B3, a uh, local engineering firm here is actually the one who's handled the design on that. And we did include more base patching just based on the condition of what we're seeing. We're thinking once we mill that, we're going to do some additional base repairs uh, out there. So when you have an STP grant, IDOT sets that up where you do what's called this LAFO, which you don't, you don't have the ability to kind of pick what it is they dictate to you what that resurfacing uh, depth is. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Go through. Is that going all the way from 71st Street from 53 to Woodridge? Or just to Roberts? Uh, just to approximately Roberts. If you remember, it was probably about four years ago. We actually did a, a full reconstruction. Um, we got some grant funds on that, leading from Woodridge Drive to, I think it was about uh, Nadelhofer, and then from Nadelhofer to Roberts, we had resurfaced that, uh, that area. And that's a great example. We were talking before about the base and how important it is. That was a section of roadway years ago. They used what was called Pozzolanic base. Um, it tends to absorb moisture as opposed to a larger stone that lets uh, water flow through, it almost turns to concrete. So you lose that flexibility in the structure. Um, and over time, the road really just uh, crumbles. Very common material from years ago. Uh, we had a, a full depth project this past summer. Uh, same thing, we did corings. The corings looked like it would be typical aggregate. Uh, when we did the uh, pulled off the asphalt, though, it was pozzolanic base as well. So it actually turned into a a reconstruction project. So that first section of uh, 71st will be in great shape for years to come, but it'll pick up where the last one left off and take it all the way to 53. Other questions? Well, again, thank you so much. We'll be hanging out for a while, so if you have any questions, there's a lot of coffee. Hey, I to disclose it is lit, uh, leaded, so caffeinated uh, <laughs> uh, late at night. But there's some uh, orange juice out there and cookies too. Please take those. Uh, all right, thank you very much.